I want to apologize first. I have a very bad bronchial cold, and if you have trouble in hearing, we have turned up the microphones, we think hot enough. If we if it's too high, come back one of these days and we'll give you a free opportunity to hear the same lecture again. <laughs> the, the subject this morning is an important one, and it's based very largely on the writings of St. Paul. It seems that it was recognized in ancient times that the redemptive principle in life was a very sacred one and that this redemptive principle had to do with the human soul and we find the first expression of Paul's concept in the Song of Solomon the Canticles in the Song of Solomon the king addresses the fair maiden of Jerusalem and he says my beloved is mine a good masculine possessive statement Halfway through the poem, however, he changes his tune a little bit. He says, My beloved is mine, and I am my beloved's. And at the end of the poem, he says the simple words, I am my beloved's. The whole change of tone shows what we might call the redemptive power of love. First it was possessive, gave some, very, very little and took all. Then it became more or less democratic, gave some and took some to the, for the beloved. And at the end, it gave all. And this is the principle of the, the idea as it is found in the Bible. This is why St. Paul speaks so strongly of love. The greatest of these is love. And that it is the great redemptive power that this power is the thing that takes people, lifts them out of themselves, and makes them the custodians of nations and a great world's works. The idea, consequently, of the redemptive power goes into alchemy, where we find it is the transmutation of various factors into the production of the universal medicine. Actually, we have the transmutation of personal emotion into divine emotion. We have a power that lifts the individual out of his own concerns and brings him into sharing with the universal purpose. The ancients nearly always had some deity upon which they wished and adored with the various faculties of their possessions. This idea of the giving all as a proof of ultimate affection goes on and St. Paul finally establishes it more or less in the human heart that instead of the heart being the seat of deity uh, the uh, deity remained forever in the infinite but the redemptive power of deity was the power in the heart of the individual which redeemed him and which enabled him to redeem his world therefore the redemptive power of to change all things to make them better is in the heart of the individual. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Well, in the course of time, we see that times change, and the individual now thinks very largely of himself. He thinks of his whole nature of being his own. He doesn't realize that there is within him a part of a redemptive power in the universe the redemptive power of selfless love. Anyone can be selfish with a little practice, and most people are without much practice. <laughs> but it is very rare to find a person who is completely dedicated <coughs> to a redemptive way of life. <coughs> this redemptive way of life is the giving of self completely. The giving of personal considerations all for the advancement of some cause greater than themselves. And this cause can be the redemption of their own light and natures, or the redemption of a family, or in higher postures, the uh, def defending and re remending of a nation. It was all possible according to this thought that we have. 
Now bringing this very sensitive thing down to our own personal living, there are things we can all learn from this, things that we will be much better to know and understand. In the individual himself, there is a power by means of which he is capable of transmuting nearly all of the difficulties and problems of his existence. This transmuting power is the power of love. The heart is the great crucible. It is the great uh, alchemical receptacle in which a great transmutation is constantly taking place. In the old Rosicrucian manifestos, the heart is represented as a universe in itself with elements and universal symbols. There are old penitenti and Central European symbols of the crucifixion taking place in the human heart. Everything that is religious is centered in the heart, which is on the uh, crest of Mount Moriah outside of Jerusalem, according to the anatomy of, of the sacred body of God. So we have now this problem of the redemptive factor that is in the person. This redemptive factor becomes or should become the guiding light of their lives. It is not that they should omit to reveal the deity who is the Lord of all things, but recognize that within themselves is a regent <coughs> capable of administering to the needs of human beings. This regent is love. Love is that which goes before self. True love is unselfish. The moment it is selfish, it is not true. Now in the course of time and in the descent of civilizations into one kind after another, love has gradually been profaned until it becomes very largely a material emotion. And we also want to realize that as this happens, many changes take place in the constitution of the individual himself. As his emotions change, so does his health, so does his happiness, so does his security is in life and so do his hopes and his hope for life beyond. All these things have to do with what happens in his own heart while he is alive. We have a world today with all kinds of terrible problems and almost all these problems center one or two things that we can easily notice in the various contested contests that arise. Which one is moved or regulated by unselfish love? What nation is trying best and continuously to use all its means to create peace, to create happiness, to take care of the needy, to advance the causes of gentle arts and crafts? What leader is without personal selfishness? What leader is uncorrupted by temptation? In other words, which one is following the renovating power of the heart? As long as there is corruption in the heart, the fate of nations is under stress and under delay. We say, therefore, that in the heart we have the beginning of character, we have the beginning of integrity, we also have the beginning of a collapse of these things as selfishness gradually takes over. There is a little Sicilian church that is very interesting. It has the heart as a symbol in the church. And in the heart, the devil is enshrined in a beautiful chapel in the, on a crown, uh, with a crown and a throne. In other words, the devil, is th in that case, is enthroned in the heart. This would be a symbol that that individual is depraved or degenerate or has turned his life over to evil things. But the redemption of man is very largely achieved by the regulation of the instincts and appetites and ideals of his heart. So we take this as a possible basis for a new relationship between man and society. We know that in the years that lie ahead many changes must come. And we are all hoping and we are praying that these changes will come soon. We hope that leaders will arise who will correct these mistakes. That peoples will rise and band and force and overcome the tyrants. But the trouble will probably be 
that the people will have to become first tyrants themselves in order to overcome the tyrants. So there lies ahead nothing but conflict, nothing but uncertainty. We have not yet realized, however, that it is impossible to legislate peace. We may be able to legislate against a certain type of violence, but we will never be able to legislate against violence itself unless it dies first in ourselves. The individual must overcome in himself all of the errors which he sees and complains about in society around him. He must look upon the world as a picture of a heart. He must look upon the nations as blood vessels. He must look at the cities as cells. He must look at the human body as a nation or the nation as a human body and that it is controlled by a heart. Now where is this heart? What is it? What is it doing? Well, there are over 150 nations. Therefore, the heart is not one organ. It is an organ for each. But above everything else, there is a common organ. There is something that uh, we must all work for and strive to maintain. And that is the divine heart. The heart of the mystic. The one heart in ourselves which together with all others of a similar nature creates the one heart of an evolving civilization. Until the individual himself redeems his own nature, he cannot expect civilization to improve. There is too much against the things that are necessary. Paul also goes back into these scriptures to find many other interesting analogies to his point, namely that he has moved the concept of Christ from the heavens and place this concept in the human heart. Christ in you, the hope of glory. And that this Christ in you is the Christened consciousness of heart. It is love in the final, unselfish, eternal mood. Love that thinks not of itself, but of all things. Love that does not cherish its own properties, but protects the properties of all. In other words, there is a love that is a personal. Love of individual for individual. A love of friend for friend. A love of leader for leader. But there is another heart and another love. And that is the complete total love of God as manifested in the heart of man. Therefore, that we have in man's own heart the great peacemaker. It is not only the pacemaker, but the peacemaker. It is the one great organ of integrities. It is the dedication to this that proves the individual's dedication to God. And he, by proving dedication to God, protects civilization from corruption. The dedicated person will not be correct, will not be covetous, covetous, or do things that are wrong. The undedicated person will occasionally do something right, but will usually be mistaken or, inex or inevitable in their works and, do and do doings. They will be inadequate. After, therefore, that we take all this, we say, in the heart we have this center, the center that represents our whole kingdom of life. The whole world of the beloved begins in the heart and grows as a seed and grows from their seed to a great tree that is for the healing of the nations. And this tree is the so human soul arising from the great root in the heart. Now the way this is, was originally intended is that there should be faiths, philosophies, and doctrines that would be developed by the heart concept and turned over to the keeping of the heart enlightened people where we have a new discovery in music or a new discovery in anatomy and physiology, the righteous person immediately dedicates this discovery to the world good. The individual places his discovery upon the living altar of his God, as this altar is in his own heart. If he makes a great discovery in science, he dedicates it to the need of the world. If he makes a great discovery in diplomacy, he dedicates that. If he wants to write a great book, he dedicates that. 
All these things are from the, are lifted up and dedicated upon the altar of eternal good. They are no longer held for an individual. They are no longer kept fin finally and completely for uh, royalty or something of this nature. You don't worry by selling. It isn't something in which you immediately sell and make all you can for yourself. Everything that is necessary to man must come to man through man. And when that come, thing comes, it comes to his heart, and from his heart it is released to the world because he is a good religious person. So we find that there is an absence of this religion. We find people doing all kinds of things for their own advantage, not for the advantage of the common good. And as this continues in this direction, problems will become more and more strenuous. This is one of the reasons, probably, why in antiquity we had so many uh, orders set aside of people for various types of worship. We had various groups that renounced the world and worldliness and lived fully and completely to serve the human need. We know had brotherhoods and sisterhoods of sacred persons. We had temples of healing. We had temples of wisdom. All of them serving this mysterious power of good in the heart. For all of these enlightened individuals were enlightened into comradeship, into a state of brotherhood, a state of natural loving, which was, in fact, the redemptive power in every case. The individual is redeemed when he overcomes his own selfishness. He overcomes his own egotism. He gives up the false prides and false activities which make him dangerous to himself and others. Therefore, the regeneration of society begins with returning the leadership of life to the matchless altar of the human heart. Therefore, working in our studies, in this series that we're working on, we are going to work on the concept of love. Not just simply ordinary love, but not, not ignoring it, but trying to make it understandable why this is one of the most powerful transmuting agency, agencies available to the human being. It is something that is his own. It is something that very often begins as a joyous or glorious experience. It is something in which everything becomes easier and more beautiful. It is something in which problems such as temptation are done away with before they have a chance to actually arise. If each individual in his own way served truth to the best of his abilities, there would be no war. war. But we can pass laws against wars for a hundred years and still have them because the change has not been made in the deep centers of the human soul. Now, the, <coughs> the um, ancient beliefs were to the effect that the human soul was, in a sense, the beginning of a new being in man. This human soul was a spiritual being, being created all the time by the, man, by the person. The uh, beginning of the human soul was always the seed of divinity which is in the heart and which is served and helped to develop by considering the heart as a garden in which there are all kinds of plants and things were growing. In this heart the tree of life grew and the tree of good and evil, the leaves of which were for the healings of the nations. And this tree that grew up in the heart was by the ancients called the soul. And the soul seed was the mysterious, magical, transmuting agency of alchemy. Now this soul seed in the human heart is the thing that is growing by this process of redemption, of transmutation, and of the re restoring of principles. And uh, it is not visible, but Paracelsus and many others made pictures of it. It was this fact that in the heart of man there is not only this wonderful presence of the divine power, the power of love, infinite love, but this infinite love is the cradle of a new life, a new existence, a new order of being, a new way of existence. This little cradle, so to say, is like the manger 
in, in Nazareth. It is born in the stable. The stable is the body, which is physical, surrounded by animals, the organs of the body, living in a material world, threatened from the beginning, but destined and foreordained to exist, to endure, to continue, and in the end, to become the healing of the nations. So we have all this tied into the heart. And it, all of it is part of one thing. For out of this uh, de dedication to the principles involved, we find the gradual rising of the soul constitution. In other words, the heart, with its true affection, is telling us the story of its own quality. In other words, love, unselfish love for all that exists, is the is the force flowing from the soul from that th power which is created in man but goes on to eternity uh, the soul is the body a part of man which has a beginning but no end but eternity its seed is that of ages of evolution and growth it goes on to become the final lord of all that lives and in all parts it is beautiful in all parts it is good its virtue is complete there's no evil, evil or no transiency in it. And so uh, the mystics developed whole sciences relating to the soul, relating to the heart and its mystery, relating to the, the rena renovative power of emotion. Now as we get down a little further into the problem of heart as a representation of soul, we come also to daily life. We have all kinds of love. We're going to take up some of them in the present series. We have love of country, a patriotism. Now it can be very secondary. The average individual probably isn't at any particular time anxious to go out and die for his country. But it's the country he respects it and he supports it in its emergencies and when it calls he answers. Then there is the love of nature. The love of going out and commuting quietly with the flowers and plants. The, the love of going out and sitting by the mountainside and contemplating of the beauty of the infinite. And in this beauty that it contemplates, the heart and mind experience something of the divinity that lives and develops through all things. Then, of course, there is other types of love of art, great painting, Michelangelo, Leonardo da Vinci, works of art that have been loved and cherished by centuries among the great and noblest products of human being. Not so ancient, but so also so renovated and revered is music, which has always been part of the story of human rehabilitation. The harmonies of music are symbolical of the harmonies of the soul. And when music is distorted, it is distorted by the distortions in the soul which permit it. If, it was, if the soul did not permit it, it would not be so distorted. So the soul must be brought into order. It must be refined, reformed, and built into the realization of that which was good. And all through life, there are jobs of every kind that you can take. There's profession, there's work, there's art, music, all these different classes of occupation. All of them containing the mystery of this wonderful art story. There is in every art and science part of the soul. The soul is the source of all beauty, of all virtue, and of all good. And in appearance it is all invisible to the eyes, but visible to the inner nature as peace. Peace and harmony. Peace and friendship. Peace in the family, in the community. We are now in a period of time in which families are in great difficulty. There doesn't seem to be any way of controlling the various pressures that have arisen. Well, most of the trouble is due to the fact that no, nowhere now is it obvious that we are da actually dealing with a direct expression of the heart principle. The, we have all kinds of occupations and our recreations, but most of them are selfish, self-centered, or unimportant. We do not have our joys arising from great foundations, but from trivia. Instead of recognizing the tremendous import of the universe itself 
as the greatest of all instruments, we are satisfied to sit around and play on a banjo out of tune, thinking that we are doing something quite unusual. We are so unusual it should never be done. And the, uh, we go on with these things, and we find we are living in a universe in which we are simply doing nothing with the best part of it. We are living to act, uh, fill the active pursuits of the day, most of them self centered We are there trying to make a few extra dollars. We are trying to advance various causes or advance ourselves in various positions in nature and in business, but no thought at the, of the great internal integrities upon which our own lives and the life of everything we know depends. The human being is not simply a little isolated creature in a desert of waiting. We are not simply isolated, left alone to hope and to fear, to live and to die because by forces that we know nothing about. We are here as part of one tremendous plan. We are here because of the eternality of ourselves. We are here because we are the potential laborers in a tremendous enterprise. The whole universe waits upon the labors of its creatures. And we are sitting around wondering why something better doesn't happen. We are not working with these things. We are not accepting the challenge of right use. And yet there have been enough people all down through the way to have used these things well to be able to show us what way to go. It's perfectly possible to understand music or a, a, a philosophy, a religion. These things have been engineered. They have been brought forward from the past. They have been put in reasonable order and arrangement. There is no reason why there should be anything so strange and impossible about them. For a few hundred dollars we can take a, a series of lessons on toe ballet music, uh, dancing. We also can, for a few hundred dollars, get a recipe for taking off overweight. We can get almost anything we want. But why do we never want the things that are most important? Why is it that we do not recognize the tremendous importance of releasing from its captivities the power in ourselves which alone can solve our problems? Why is the soul not given control of the life? It is because of the same type of thing that we find very much today with young people. We do not want to give up the possession of our faculties and accept our own judgment as in, inadequate. We do not want to allow the superior to rule. We are not the superior or the superiority, superiority of ourselves is not ruling. Therefore we want to continue on our own way, making the same mistakes as final proof that we are free and equal. We are not free and we are equal only to the mediocre. Therefore there is nothing gained whatever. But here now we are coming to the end of another generation. There's been lots of talk about what's going to happen in the 21st century. And we look around us and it seems to be a little more ominous, ominous all the time. Something it seems to be in the air. Something that's a little frightening, a little disturbing. And in this emergency, a number of groups of people are coming forward to study a little more deeply the problems which we face. And one of the most interesting discoveries that is being made is that no one has really addressed the problem. We have all talked about it ever since writing was invented. But when we allowed someone to mention that it interfered with our way to do exactly as we pleased, it was better to shut up the individual who mentioned it than try to make the correction. Therefore we have gone on doing exactly what we wanted to do. On a sort of a formula, we want to be right but right or wrong, we're going to be ourselves. So they come into the verge of another century. But we have been ourselves so long that it's becoming a more or less dangerous and difficult situation. We are wasting the world around us and starving the world within us. We are making every possible effort to kill off the source of our own survival and at the same time begging desperately for that survival. We are now working and thinking in terms of going into other planets rather than to clean this one up. 
They were, I saw an article not long ago in which some humorist pointed out that the best way to get to to get over this congestion and corruption is to move somewhere else and leave this as the garbage pail. And this type of thing we are beginning to realize, but not to the degree that it may change us. Other people should do better. But why don't we change? Because there's only one way to change, and that is by changing this thing inside. And we, most people don't even believe it exists. And if they do believe it exists, they hope it'll keep quiet. <laughs> Actually, uh, the only way we can solve any of these problems is to vitalize our own integrities. We have got to do the things that make life better for ourselves and other people. And when we've come to some place like a bad case of rock music, we have to recognize that down in the soul of us, something can tell us that this is not right, that we are damaging ourselves and damaging others, that our entertainment is not right, it is corrupting our morals and damaging our codes of, of conduct. Why do we do it? Because we want to. Why do we want to do this? Because it permits us to do exactly as we please with a minimum of effort and no definite uh, education for it. We don't get educated to become uh, no dope fiends. We remain uneducated, or if we are schooled and the dope fiend is a postgraduate if I holding a Phi Beta Kappa, it means that he's never been educated at all in spite of his credentials. Everything is based on a merit system in nature. And the merit system tells us that the supreme ruler of our lives is not ourselves in our common sense of the word. It is not that self that gets hungry. It's not that self that wanders around uh, trying to get around the alcohol restriction or to drive cars while on the alcohol. Uh, the, the real self we don't know. The self that no one knows is self that is locked in the heart. Locked in that part of divinity which placed itself in our bodies and in our shades and shadows in order to become a seed for the growing of the flowers of the nations. We find in the book of Apocalypse many references to the plants that are going to be for the healings of the nations. We are told of the wonderful things that are going to come, but we are also reminded of the four horsemen that walk the earth or ride the earth, bearing confusion and death with them. Actually, we have to pause for a moment and recognize that we have a contribution we can make. This contribution does not require that we spend two dollars and a half for a textbook. It does not require that we take a long course to find out what to do next. It simply invites us uh, to be a friendly, kindly, honorable people. It causes us to remember the importance of this soul power in ourselves. It helps us to understand that it doesn't take a postgraduate uh, education to get over criticizing each other. It doesn't take a tremendous background of knowledge to realize that a lazy mind is not going anywhere. We have plenty of, of opportunity and plenty of raw material to do all kinds of things. But we are corrupting the raw material in our present patterns of compromise on all moralities. We are damaging our raw materials by putting through them through academic structures which corrupt them. And we are damaging the product itself by allowing it to be exploited by persons with no morals except the desire for profit. Now with all these things to consider, it is very important that we get back there to the idea that St. Paul had in which he pointed out definitely that in all the transactions of the world, the greatest of all is love. That love alone could, rock it, could correct most of the trouble. If we loved people, we wouldn't hurt them. If we loved people, we wouldn't go on marrying the wrong ones year after year. If we loved people, we wouldn't leave orphans to the state by the thousand. By all these things, everything is selfishness. We do as we please, we do what we want to, and the devil takes the eye the most. And at the, same, and at the present moment, the, death, the devil is breathing so close to us that we're all worried to death. All these things have to be worked through better. 
sit quietly down someday and just contemplate your own assets and liabilities. Realize that with, on, on the outside of yourself you are a perishable creature that is going to last a certain number of years all being equal. Maybe it will last a little longer, maybe not nearly as long. That's all about to fate and circumstance. But the outside is mortal, corruptible, and irrational. The only rational part of the body is the rationality in the cell structure, and it never gets a chance to say anything. The, uh, on the other hand, without, in the body is that thing which is rational. And that thing which is rational or reasonable or intuitive or capable of insight, that thing is crippled all the time. Every effort is made to educate it out of existence. Everyone is trying to make a good, solid materialist out of it who is going to go along 60 or 70 years and disappear forever. That everyone is supposed to live only for success in a world in which success is unknown. There is practically no success. We hear from the paper of this very successful person, but a few months later we hear of his death. There is no way of winning this great world pattern that we have made so uh, amusing and amazing to us. We are constantly thrilled by some new discovery. We find out that there is a new kind of poison that will kill bugs. And the next day it tells why it will also kill people. There is no answer to this, uh, this way. The answer is to so love one another that we make other persons' lives part of our own responsibility. Not that we want to govern them, not that we want to lead them, not that they want to make serfs out of them, but that wherever the human being is, there's a potential friend. There's a potential co-worker for a good cause. There are leaders to come. There are many who can help in countless ways to end the problems that cause war, that cause crime. One of the things I think that most people today are beginning to notice is that the, the moral issues are not clearly put to them. The, the individual isn't given a fair choice of what to do. Several candidates apply for office and all of them are equally uncertain. No one knows who is, who is the best and the chance may be the only way you could ever tell is to try to see, decide who is the worst. We have no... We have no way of doing these things. When we decide on public offices, they should be people who have lived with the heart. They should have behind them a story of health, of doing things that were good, that have, uh, the done, have lives dedicated to principles that were real and valid. Once in a while, someone like that does come along, and we venerate them, and we may canonize them and we may build monuments for them, but we're rather grateful when they leave. Simply because we did never did want to be changed as they would want to have changed us. They didn't, we didn't want to be better, we just wanted to be a little, about the same, but a little richer. And that's as far as it goes. Now, there are a lot of people we can turn to for help. All kinds of artists will give us lessons. But the supreme artist, the supreme scientist, the supreme mystic, the great theologian, and the great intellectualist, they're all under the skin. They're all in us. We have to do, you develop these faculties. The human being is an infinite creature with an infinite capacity to grow. And that this growth should be healthy, and it should be regular, and it should be continuous. And we should all be growing naturally and happily from one step of intelligence to another. There should be no conflicts and no inconsistencies in our lives. We have faculties, powers, organs of perception, everything necessary to regulate our lives. We have everything except, well, two things. The will to do it and a clear vision of which way to go. The problem, one of the problems that Paul worked on a long time and never did get to quite a personal and perfect answer to it, is to which way do we go? If we are ready to, uh, to de dedicate all to an effort to improve, what should we really do? How do we get at it, really? Well, 
everyone will ask somebody. We will pay for courses on the subject. Learned people will write books on the subject. We will make little experiments, most of which will fail, and disappointed we will drop back into the old ways. The real answer is that the answer must come through us and not to us. It must be the result of our own natural growth. Because if each day we are a little more kind and a little more honest and a little less selfish, changes take place within us. What the scientist sometimes likes to call the libido gets to work. If we become better people, we have better thoughts. If we think longer viewpoints and develop them more clearly, we have better solutions to world problems. Every solution we need must come through us, not to us. And it comes through us by we, we, because we grow up to deserve it. When we reach a point where that solution is the next level of our own thinking, it breaks through to us very easily and simply. But while we are contented to let it go as it is, not try to make any changes, drift along, follow all these uh, easy roads, and then watch ourselves being exploited day and night. If we are con continues this that way, then all mysticism, all esotericism, all these things we've studied so hard and so consistently, consistently become nothing. No matter how many books we read, if nothing grows, there is no life. If we take all kinds of lessons and come out of the school with the same morality and ethics we went in, there is nothing to be gained. And anyone who seeks to develop and become more than he is and is satisfied to do it only by improving the looks of his body, he is also misdrained completely. We are not there to develop a pleasant, dominating, world-captivating personality. What we are there for in life is to develop strong and enduring principles and integrities. But the interesting point is that the two work together very neatly. And the individual who actually attains this integration also attains to a looks about themselves, a way of living, a way of thinking. Even my, the lines on the face and hands, everything, become beautiful. The beauty on the inside comes out, but the beauty that's on the outside and doesn't go in is useless. And this is what we're struggling with again. Now we are already in the, in the throes of further international complications. We just get rid of one war and another one threatens. And all of this thing is selfish. Now also in this situation, as Paul points out, there is a certain religious factor that we also have to be very careful of. It is true and beyond a doubt that the most destructive force in the world has been theological. If we go back through history, the religious conflicts have killed more people than the great world wars of modern times. Or they're still killing them. Or they're still destroying them. They're trying to wipe out the ethics because it interferes. All around are nations trying to be materialistic, and now our daily papers show how all of them are in trouble. Materialism is a hopeless answer. And we know it now, but we'll keep on trying to do it. There will always be someone who thinks they can break the rules of nature and of God. But the man who rules, breaks the rules of nature dies the sooner, and the nation that breaks the rules of God collapses the sooner. These things just do not work that way. So we have now a great problem coming up. How are we going to solve these problems? Are we going to solve them by a great big world conflict or a great big world congress? or a great big something or other, or by collecting, uh, assembling a committee of people, not one of whom has an answer, but together might have, but won't, and letting it rest that way. We'll be right back where we were because no one will find there's any answer, because no one is looking in the right place. If you want an answer, think, sit quietly and look inside. Look what you know would be best for you. And don't remember the fact that you wouldn't like it. But remember that if it's best for you, ultimately you will like it. If you are, if you are satisfied to become an alcoholic, uh, that is inevitable. Or if you are entitled 
to continue uh, smoking your favorite brand of cigarette as long as you live. That's all right. You have the right to. But you must pay the bill. And there's no way to escape the bill just because you like to. And in all these problems in life, there is, you can do as you please and suffer. And you can do what is right and get over the suffering. And the problem is, which is the most important? The pleasure of the moment, which will go in a short time, or the suffering of the moment by correction, through which may produce, you may produce a lifetime of improved health and happiness. The uh, whole situation, as we have it now, is assuming very largely that the answers are not going to be found, that we are going to have to make one after another strange and in, uh, ineffectual changes. We are going to have to do things on the basis of this will make it last another year. But the main solutions are not there because the main solutions will not be there while we take a little planet which is no bigger than this one and try to put into it over six billion people and then have all of them want to open It's just too much. And it's too much if even a half a dozen get together and try to own it. What do they own? They own a, a pinball in, in space. They own virtually nothing. And by the abusing of what they find this way, they lose what they did have. We have come into a, to a, a world that has been exhausted by exploitation, ignorance, and selfishness. And now, none of those factors are religious. It is not true that we were foreordained and predestined to kill ourselves. It is not true that the highest phase of religion is to believe nothing. These things are false attitudes, and they are attitudes which we have to work out. Uh, they are the seat of good attitudes. The home of the real principles that we should be cherishing is in ourselves. And in the heart is the dweller in the innermost. And it is this dweller, always silent but always there, that can give us the impulses and the, uh, give us the uh, pressures to make the changes that are necessary. We see every once in a while some great person comes along who has made these changes who has done these things, and the world admires them. But the world thinks it's a sort of strange. It's all right for other people to be good and to give up all the vices that they think they like. But nobody wants to be that good person. They're happy that that person has done it, and they might even raise a small fund to help take care of that person. But there's no enthusiasm for being like it or doing the same thing themselves. We had this problem of Mother Teresa, which has been quite a moving one in recent years. But no one is rushing by the hundreds to become Mother Teresa. It is simply that they respect greatness, but they have not the instinct to want to achieve it at the expense of being small people. And this is true in religion in all these different fields that we're in. In our field, we're working very hard to try to help people to unfold the innermost parts of their own natures. And we think to ourselves, let's try to find some way to help people to grow, to help to give them and make available to them the things that they need. Now, when you do this, what happens? We probably have a lot of very sincere people now trying to find better ways. Well, if an individual will read 12 books and go to 20 different teachers and take a dozen different classes on every subject you can think of, and then go home and two months later break their home, walk out on the family. It doesn't mean anything too much. All this intellectual attainment is something that you can get good at or you can do meditations or write books under clairvoyant influence, but when it comes right down to raising a family in a healthy, constructive manner as part of religion, it's not so common. But it's the few who say, I have made written obligations, these I will keep. I am not living to get out of my labors and obligations, but to perfect them. This immediately becomes a positive statement. And any individual who is out working to fulfill something, to accomplish something that needs doing, on which they, they know it's possible within their power to do it, well, they're working that way, they're growing. And the philosophy of life is growth. It is not uh, uh, saving up and storing up 
a mass of intangibles. The things we are always looking for in people who are students is growth. The individual who wishes to be better. But we, uh, we find too often that little, little ulterior motives are cropping out on all sides. We can do tell, we can do a little, but what we really want to know is who is it that has a job that they don't care for very much, but what needs to be done, and in which there would be a great amount of personal growth as a result of doing it. If we can convince people with those problems to do the thing that answers, we'd soon have a lot of better people in this world. We'd have a better generation growing up. We'd have less chance of war. We would have a reduction of crime. But the individual who is constantly aware of what is wrong, but does not wish to change his own ways to make it any better, is, is the problem we all have to face. And uh, Paul was aware, fully aware that there was no way of blocking, breaking through that personality from the outside. That individual may make all these mistakes, give his life to God and be burned at the stake and still not correct his mistakes. It is something different from this. It has to happen. And this thing that has to happen is the recognition of deity as an indwelling eternal. There's something that is always available. That while we have a dozen small temptations, we have one tremendous guide toward truth, if we want to use it. Well, there are all kinds of ways in which we can do a little of this and a little of that. There is a one way in which we can do what we were here to do, and that is grow. And growth is the only thing in the end that will bring lasting peace and happiness. The more people grow, the better the world will be. And that each individual in the world becomes part of an environment. And the improvement of individuals improves environment. And improved environment again improves, improves more individuals. It goes on until a major change takes place. What we need now from the world is a good solid statement of what we must be doing and why we must not do it. Why we must do it. If these committees that are meeting everywhere in the world would get together and work for one purpose, to create a a pattern for satisfactory citizenship. A pattern of what a civil service person must be. And no other kind will be acceptable. If they can make the career of leadership something that is a responsibility to serve the people instead of an opportunity to double the salary. We've got to have this different point of view. But when we get that point of view, I can pretend at least that we have leaders who can lead and followers who have sense enough to follow when the leader is right and sense enough not to follow if the leader is wrong. Then we have the individual of nearly, two, nearly six billion of them in all walks of life, of all colors, all shades, all degrees of intellect and all degrees of wisdom out here in this tremendous hinterland that we call the earth. These people, each one of them, has within it a fragment of immortality. The only thing that is real is these people. The only thing that is important is to release the integrities of these people. For well, these released integrities are the only answer to our pressing need for the future. If we can bring the people into patterns of intelligence, this planet can carry a very nice load for many thousands of years to come, with no one deprived of anything essential. But if everyone goes crazy and uses everything they can for an odd an dollar for themselves, we are going to be in a very bad way in the next hundred years. So the time is to move from the law of the jungle, which is what most people have lived by, to the law of the gods. And that is a law of to live in honor and in law in the service of truth. And that the great power of the total reality of things, that we call the infinite deity, is present in each of us in a fragment of itself, the seed of its own eternity. And that each of these seeds is capable of growing and unfolding to become a wonderful witness in the court of the Lord. And each of those who come in to worship carries in his heart 
the seed of that which he worships. Before the altar he communes with his deity. But every day and every night he lives with God. Because whether he knows it or not, if God is not there, he is dead. So that we have all these things to do. And things can be done if people will start simple daily efforts to do it right. To become better citizens in private affairs. Not to oh, some of these public things we talk about. But the slow down on the criticisms that destroy hope. Slow down on the differences which magnify, present, present final restriction. Slow down on the dividing forces. Not, don't try so hard to be a complete individual in spite of anybody else who's alive. Be not so quite so fast to want to have all things your way. Share instead of demand. Give instead of take. And you will find gradually that the flowers will bloom again in the desert. That we are gradually blighting everything by the fact that we are trying desperately to become despots. And as despots, we are in trouble. For it was not so intended. It is intended that, not that we are our brother's keeper, but that we are our brother's friend. And that a common love, the love of humanity, the love of natural being, the love of people who like to be together, the love of God, which is the final form of adoration. All these things, if developed, obviously and adequately, will make this world the kind of place we want to live in. But if we don't do something with it, we're going to gradually get it worse and worse. And someday we're going to be crazy enough to say there is no God. And that for that time they might be right, because they will have killed it. Now the way they kill, you kill a God is very simple. You just get rid of the people who have God in their souls. And that you, those people, when they go, there is no longer any contact with the environment. The deity in heaven remains. New worlds will be formed. New nations will come forth. New projects will be invented. New planets will be fertile for, set, for salvation. But the one that leaves everything to, and uh, departs completely from the laws of life has life removed from them. And they will not have this opportunity except to go back to the beginning and start over. We have to uh, do something to think things through more definitely, uh, more realistically. We have to take the ideals and dreams that we have all had and which we are all trying to do. We must take our reading and our writing and our thinking and try to make it fit into a pattern of being better people. Keep a little card with a pad by it for a while. And every time you're irritated by somebody, put it down. And see after a day or two if you can't clean it up. Every time you scandalize someone, make a note of it. Every time you put some desire of yourself at the, at the head of a list to the loss of someone else, put it down. Keep track of your mistakes. It's easy to forget them. But if you keep track of them, you will very shortly find that you, each person has a little circle of mistakes that they are most likely to make. Some individuals just can't keep quiet. They can't keep it a secret. They can't refrain from spreading gossip or bad news. Another one cannot stand criticism and explodes in the face of it. Another has great antagonism to a religion or a philosophy or to a person. Others hate their neighbors. Some hate their parents. But all of these things, if written down, if I am a mature, grown-up person and looked over by that person, will begin to look pretty foolish. And in a short time, with a little discipline, they can rub out those names and those words one by one until they can face life without prejudice, conceit, or effort to d disintegrate someone out through, else through jealousy or something of that nature. So we want to put all this philosophy we can to work. It needs to work. We need it every day now. It's getting close. So if we can do as best we can, we can all get somewhere and we'll all be better for it. And we'll agree, I think, a little bit that uh, 
uh, may possibly St. Paul is right that hope, faith, and love these are the three but the greatest of these is love and love is the thing that takes bitterness out of life it takes malice out of life not only in nations but in individuals it is the forgiveness of the ills of each other and the willingness to forgive as we would be forgiven and out of that comes the very basic essence of the best of Christian religion which is the religion of letting the God in the heart rule the mind and the hand and dedicate the labors of the life to the accomplishment of good okay